We have seen different representations so far for terrains. The four most common that we've seen are these. So the point clouds, the raster, which is a grid of regular cells, uh, the tin and also iso lines. In this lesson, we look at all the possible conversions between these four representations. In practice, one will rarely have the representation that she needs for a given application. So for example, she will have different data sets, sometimes only points, sometimes only ISO line, but then the application that she's doing, for example, runoff modeling, which we will see later, uh, usually requires a grid. So it means that you, she, the person that needs to perform the operation will need to convert all the data to one given representation, which can be one of these four. Usually it would be mostly tin and raster, but it could also be any of these. Um, the conversion between different representation will potentially introduce a lot of errors and artifacts, so it's important to be aware of all the details on how these operations are performed. With the four types, we have in total 12 possible conversions. Some of them are very easy and they've already been covered in the previous lessons and in the assignment. So for example, how to go from point clouds to tin and raster, it's simply by using interpolation. Um, special ones that are pretty obvious, if you want to go from a grid to a point cloud, you can just keep the center points of every pixel, for example. And if you want to go from a tin to a point cloud, then you could simply drop all the edges and triangles and simply keep the vertices. What we're most interested in are uh, three types of conversion. So the first one is how to convert a point cloud, a raster, or a tin to a set of ISO lines. So we will study in this lesson first how to go from tin to ISO lines, and after that, how to go from a raster to ISO lines. Then the second uh, topic of this lesson is the tin simplification. So given a tin that has, for example, a thousand points, we want to create one that has 10% of these points, maybe 100, 150 points, and we want to obtain a surface that approximates as best as possible the original tin. Tin simplification can also be used to convert a raster to a tin. And the third uh, topic that we will discuss are how to convert ISO lines to uh, tin and raster, for example. And we will also cover the uh, difficult cases that we encounter when we do that. ISO lines are usually extracted from either a raster grid or a tin. That is, we need a complete surface to be able to extract a, a set of ISO lines. The basic idea, as it's shown here, is to compute the intersection between a level value, so for example, 200 meters, and each of the cell of the terrain. Of course, since we have a 2.5D surface, all the processing can be done in 2D. So it means that if we look at the intersection between each cell, then we just we simply need to perform basic operations in 2D. So the idea is basically to take individually every cell, as we can see here, uh, for a simple case. So if we have a few triangles, we can just say that we take a few cells and individually we linearly interpolate within the, uh, in, within the cell or within each edge of the cell. So uh, we just find where are the elevation at uh, 10 in this case here. So where do we have 10? We basically linearly interpolate on each edge. And then for every triangle, we basically extract the line segment that would form the uh, line segments. It we can now see different configurations of one triangle where we want to extract the uh, elevation at 10. So we can see that, for example, we can have no intersections, but then if we modify the elevation of one or more of the vertices, that we can see that we can have uh, one, well, one line, one line segment that's extracted for one triangle. The most complicated case is the one where um, two of the vertices of a triangle are exactly at the same elevation as uh, the ISO line, so in this case 10. So um, if we simply look at one triangle individually, then we will need to extract uh, one of the edge of the triangle, for example here. But in practice, this triangle will often be incident to another one, unless it's on the boundary of the data set. Uh, so if we want to, uh, if we process every triangle individually, so what could happen is that we extract that line twice. Uh, visually, that's not really a problem, but if we would like to further process the lines, then uh, we don't want to do that. So the idea is basically we can simply say 
for instance, that for every triangle, we decide to only process, uh, if we calculate the normal of uh, a triangle, so we could say that we only process a line uh, if it's exactly one line of the triangle, only if it's normal is in a certain direction, for example, in uh, two quadrants, and if it's in the other one, then we don't do it. If we have a raster, then the cells that we have are square. So in this case, the exact same idea can uh, be used. So we can simply linearly interpolate along the four edges of a square and uh, find where the intersection at 10 are, for example, and then join them. The only problem that we have is that when we have a square, then we can have an ambiguity if we have a saddle point. So if you can see here, if we have a saddle point, if we uh, extract the um, intersection along the edges at elevation 10, then we have four intersections. And then we need to be careful to join them in such a way that the contour lines do not intersect. Both ways are good. It doesn't matter, but we need, we need to avoid that the contour lines are intersecting. The simplification problem can be summarized as such. Let's say we have a Delaunay triangulation with a certain amount of points, let's say 100. Then the aim is to find a subset of these points. So let's say we obtain 20 points out of the 100. And the thin of, the, of this subset will approximate as good or as accurately as possible the original thin. Uh, we say that something will uh, approximate accurately, and by this we mean that the two surfaces that we obtain, so the two tins, should be as close as possible. There's many algorithms to do this. In the handout, we describe two algorithms, and both algorithms are based on the idea of keeping only important points. And uh, a point is defined as important if the, as you can see in the figure here, if the distance between that point and the original tin is um, less than a certain threshold, for example, which is defined by the epsilon max here. So if we look at a triangulation in a set of points in 1D, like we have here, and we triangulate it, so let's see that's a profile view of a tin, um, we can describe how the two algorithms are working. So first we have the algorithm that is called refinement. So the idea of refinement is that we start with a very crude triangulation only of, let's say, the bounding points of a certain data set. So in that case, we only put the two extreme data set and we create a triangulation. In our case, it's a line, but that would be a set of two triangles, for example, if we kept four points. Then the idea is to add, at, uh, we iteratively go over every point and then for every point we, calcul we calculate what is the importance of that point. So what is the vertical distance between that point and the tin that we currently have. If we do that for every point, you can see here that we would add one point and then what we do is that we insert this point into the triangulation and then we um, by inserting that point, we update the triangulation to obtain and maintain a Delaunay triangulation. So if we do that at every step, so we start with two points and we add one, then we add another one and so on. And then we can continue until all the points that are leftovers are within the tolerance that was given as input, which is uh, epsilon maximum, for example. The other algorithm that is called decimation will do actually the opposite. So this algorithm assumes that you start with already a tin of your uh, set of points that you have in input. So you have the original tin surface. And then for every point, it visits every point. And then for every point, what it does is that it says, if that point wasn't in the triangulation, so if I remove that point, so what it does is that it removes temporarily the point from the triangulation and then retriangulate. Uh, the tin. So it says if that point didn't exist, what is what would be the distance between that point and the surface that I would obtain? And then the idea is to remove the points that are not important in that case, so the ones for which this distance is the minimum. So in that case here, you can see that we remove one point on the right and then one point on the left, and then we obtain a surface. So it's um, in the handout, it's explained how you can uh, implement these two algorithms and it's also explained what properties they have. So the resulting surfaces would have slightly different uh, properties. If the data set that you have is formed by a set of ISO lines, then the simplest solution is to convert these lines to a set of points. 
that can be done, for example, by simply keeping all the vertices of the polylines that you have. But it's also possible to simply say that if the distance between two vertices is longer than 10 meters, for example, then I would like to insert a point. But the idea is that simply to go from a data set that's formed of line to one that's formed of points. Once you have points, it's tempting to say, well, I could just use all any of the interpolation methods that we've seen previously, interpolate, and then I would obtain uh, what I want to do in this case, con uh, obtain a raster or a tin, for example. You should, however, be aware that if you start with a data set that was obtained from a set of ISO lines, then if you interpolate, for example, here what you see here is the result of using uh, nearest neighbor interpolation to the set of points, then you will obtain what is called the wedding cake effect. You can clearly see it in the example. That's an extreme case, but with other interpolation methods, you also get such results, which can, which won't look exactly like a wedding cake, but you will have the idea of steps. While this is a valid DTM, um, it's not really possible to be using um, for applications where slope is important if we want to do runoff modeling. But that's if we're using a natural neighbor. If we wanted to use, for example, a more advanced interpolation method, for example, a linear interpolation in tins, then there's also some drawbacks. If you see here, I have interpolated the same data set with a tin interpolation, and you can see that uh, many of the tins, uh, uh, you can see the results. So actually the surface is pretty nice at many places. You can notice that where we had ridges, for example, the tin interpolation creates triangles that are flat, so you can clearly see them, so triangles that are purely horizontal. So these triangles are not only causing artifacts in the, in, in the surface when you look at it, but also if you want to perform interpolation, for example, as you will see in the next lesson where we do runoff modeling, flat areas are problematic. Solving the problem with flat triangles is beyond the scope of this course. We give one a nice paper to read in the handout. You can read it if you want. It's not material that will be used in the exam. Um, but the idea of the paper is, as can be seen here, is to insert new points that are located halfway between two adjacent ISO lines, for example. So if we wanted to do that, then we can say that if we are between two ISO lines, one that is at 70 meters, the other one at 80, then we can answer a lot of points that are, for example, at 75 meters. <laughs>